This is a really important picture to us as a company. I mean, well, thanks Alex, we are. We've been around 70 years this year, but we started putting a lot of those pictures up around, around the business because we're reminding ourselves we're a food company. And the person that's going to receive that meal is the most important person because all the value in our industry comes from the person that's going to eat that product. So I want to talk to you about value-based marketing as an, an alternative way of thinking about the beef industry and, and or how we traditionally do in, the, in commodity and commodities. We spent the last four or five years as a business, and I'll show you that's us, and we'll talk about that in a minute, getting away from talking about Japan markets and China markets, et cetera, and focusing on customers. And we concentrate really on, on our critical collaborative customers. We don't care where they are in the world. Um, what's really important is that we give them what they need. That's really there to say why we're here. I mean, the success of the beef industry and our successes are intrinsically linked. I mean, we are a, we're a large company now. We've got run six meat processing plants across the eastern seaboard of Australia, stretching from Rockhampton and Billawheeler in central Queensland, down to Narracourt in the south. There's three cattle feedlots in there and some value-adding businesses. We export today to about 45 countries, uh, employ about uh, 4,500 people today. We've recently downsize the business a bit because, as you saw from Trish there, the cattle supply has gone down, so we have to adjust our business. And that's the reason why, I mean, it's a really simplistic diagram, right, but that's a traditional commodity cycle. Uh, and it's one that we've ridden in, in the beef industry ever since it started. Two years ago, we would, the beef processing sector would have been right at the top of that curve. You've, you've heard about record cattle turnoff, once in 35 year turnoff. Uh, and a very buoyant US market, particularly on the back of their constrained supply. That was really good for processes, but alternatively our suppliers towards the bottom of that curve. Right now, the role's reversed. Uh, and really the point is that's not good enough. I mean, sustainability means everyone in the supply chain has to do well. That's, that's a recipe for boom and bust. You've seen a lot of capacity added to the beef processing sector in the last three years. Let's come back to ABs in three years' time and see what that might look like. So we've got to do something about the commodity cycle. And this has been well pointed out by Troy and Trish earlier. We can't compete around the world on price. So no good being in a commodity market. Uh, that's labour cost on that side. Costs about $300 a head uh, in Australia to process beef on average. Labour 65% of it and our labour laws, et cetera, uh, we're not going to be able to compete with those other countries. Our energy costs are another really good example, give you a real life example. We get told the other day by our energy providers we can expect increases in utilities charges in South Australia next year of about 20%. Troy made the point before too, on the right there you can see Brazilian versus Australian cattle prices. Now that goes up and down depending on supply, but the point is today I wouldn't want to be up in Vietnam or China trying to compete on price when the raw material is twice the price. We think though, and really focus on, you can change it, as I said, if we put that per the people at the top in front. Um, <coughs> and we can, the good news is we can see in that graph underneath WTP is willingness to pay. Now MSA for years has been doing surveys of consumers when they do their MSA tests and you can see and what they found, doesn't matter what country you're in, when you improve the quality of the product, people are saying they're willing to always pay more. And research is coming out now, which has been really, really starting to <coughs> explain that that's not just because it's you know, better quality, more marbling, tastes better, it's more consistent. And that's the key at that end. People are willing to pay for things that meet their needs time and time again. Uh, and we've, the Ferrari's in the corner there. Not, um, uh, we tried to, well, you'll see in the next slide why, but <coughs> that's to remind us beef's now a luxury item. And when we market beef around the world, we shouldn't be thinking about the commodity, we call it a Ferrari instead. Because when we offer that product to a consumer, be they in Indonesia, China, or in the US, it better meet their needs every time and it better have the, attached to it the attributes that consumers <coughs> see as important. Because when you go, you don't need to tell anyone in here, when you go and buy beef versus chicken and pork today, hey, it's expensive. Uh. And we know consumers will pay more, but you've got to give them 
what they want. I know it sounds really simple, but you're going to see in a few slides why our industry has been challenged to do that. And it's not about calling a cut, a blade, a rump, a chuck. It's about giving them something that meets their needs on an occasion when they need beef to do a job. But we've got a few challenges, as I said, and the first one is, remember, that's us. We don't make things. We buy finished product and we, we pull it apart and sell the parts. I did have one of cattle, but I, I guess this looks better for most <laughs> audiences. We have to have a market for each one of those parts, and our job is to find the best market around the world to do that. That's one of the ways we combat our relatively high costs. And on the car theme, we buy all sorts, and we did just remember there's still an Australian car around, so we kept one. We buy all sorts of raw material too, so we've got all these grades running through the business. And I think Alex touched on this in an earlier presentation today. The key thing for us in our industry at the moment is the producers, the meat processor, and the customer, we don't speak the same language. So it's like, it's like the, the consumer speaks English to the poor Italian meat processor that can't speak any English, and then we, we, we go and speak to the Arabic livestock producer, and uh, you know, it's, it's some uh, horribly confused discussion at the end. And one of the challenges for us is to have a, have a consistent language. Because the theory is really simple. What it really should be, right, is the amount of meat, the amount of product multiplied by the quality, and that's what we should be paying, but it's nothing like that today. And the industry, though, is moving forward trying to look at a few of these things, and that beef language white paper has been around. It won't mean a lot to some people in the room, but I can tell you, getting that right on that side for this industry will be the single biggest way to improve farm gate returns. And I'll show you why. We can also get it right, but we've got to build trust. And you, you saw a lot of debate in the rural media, and, and particularly last year, about, and there was a Senate inquiry into processor collusion, et cetera. And that was largely to people due to complete dissatisfaction about returns. My argument is, I showed you why, it's that commodity cycle. But we've got to fix it. The other thing that really drives dislocation in the supply chain is our current grading system. The way we, we grade and pay for cattle in this country, it's not very accurate, and to be honest, it's not very fair in terms of what the consumer is willing to pay. But what it generates is this, the top rather than the bottom. Because we, when we pay people we, as a commodity, we pay them an average, the producer thinks that's what happens. There's a mob of cattle at the top. Hey, they've been, uh, they basically came from the same genetics. They've been, we think we've been reared the same. They're all the same, they should perform the same, but we know they don't. We know that actually that mob of cattle will perform like a normal distribution. And this is a better chart. What we currently pay is the orange there, that's the grid average. But we know when using value-based marketing calculation, which is really the amount of saleable meat, and we've got a, thanks to Alex and some of his colleagues, we've got a, a value proxy. We can show you in that mob of cattle, the best to the worst is a huge variation, but we're not telling the producer anything about it at the present moment. I think it's all the same. So we're not giving anyone the opportunity to make improvements by, which I'll show you. It's even clearer when you look at it across mobs. And there's six different mobs up there. We pay on that black line. That's what our grid payment system does at the moment. The actual performance of the cattle, even between mobs, varies widely, and you can see the individual animals is plus or minus $600 there. And value-based marketing really simply means we've got to start paying people closer to the dots rather than the average and giving them information that they can produce more animals that better meet specifications. There's also an animal health challenge in the country, which we'll talk about. We think a lot of those lower performing animals, they've had animal health challenges. We collect a whole bunch of data in the industry, have for 100 years through the, the, the Federal Department, about animal health, about how, uh, but we don't give any information back to producers. Good news is it's starting to change, and, we, and uh, a lot of the work led by the Rural Research and Development Corporations is driving that. We're starting to move away, we can start to move to a model that better reflects consumer value using the MSA system using some of that smart technology that uh, Alex has spoken about in an earlier presentation. 
rather than trying to sort something out using the number of teeth in the animal's head or sex, etc., and then approximating that as consumer value because there's no correlation. But that's what we've always done. And the yield's a great one. We can start to use X-ray imaging. Uh, we're not going to use the CAT scanner, by the way, because it's pretty obvious it's a bit small, but that's used for validation, right? That's the gold standard. We start to get these smart technologies in the industry, and then we set up CAT scanners to validate those equipment. But the good news is, rather than all those things, I'm not going to, we haven't got time to tell you what all those things are in the boxes on the right. We measure all those at the moment. We pay a producer on it, and the reality is it approximates less than half the yield. Um, but that can make a big difference to a producer to meeting a grade or not. We want to put these, this equipment into our businesses. We've got 100%, you know, we've got a much greater, I can't say 100%, but a much greater degree of accuracy. And we've got an image that we can have a discussion with the producer about. Uh, that technology is there at the moment. It's probably. 12, 18 months away from full commercialisation. And this is the only meat picture in, in the whole presentation. Similarly, we can get that animal health data, and that's a meat inspector, uh, a company employed meat inspector on a chain collecting data. We can tell producers about any animal health conditions there and give them opportunities to improve. Um, and this is the reason why. Um, if we can sort out true value with each animal and help producers understand what the value difference is, what's, create, what's driving value, understanding what Alex said earlier, that there's, you know, there's going to be a yield and quality trade-off, how we can demonstrate continuous improvement, we're absolutely committed we can drive dramatic change. And the example is the dairy industry. Back in 1980, you can see there, the average was about 2,800 litres per animal. It's now 5,800 litres in you know, just over 30 years. Um, and why? Dairy companies have all given clear payment signals back to producers. And our message is really simple. The very same tools, on-farm tools, that work for dairy will work for beef. We've just got to get the information right. We then have an opportunity to change how we've described beef. And this is the Australian beef uh, language classification system. And geez, it's served our industry really well for the last 30 years. It's allowed us to trade meat around the world, but trade a commodity. The problem with that, from our perspective, is it doesn't tell the consumer anything. I'm pretty sure if you all go and look for a beef meal tonight, none of those things are really going to matter to you about the number of teeth in an animal, how much it might weigh, what sex it is. Etc. And the answer is, of course it doesn't. It doesn't describe eating quality. And if we're going to put the consumer in front, we need to do something a bit smarter and, and better integrate with the MSA language. Any of the producers in the room will be very familiar with what's on the left. That's our current grid. So that's, how, that's the basis on which we form a contract with the producer and pay them. It's very small, but don't worry, it's very complicated when it's very large on the screen. But the opportunity there if we can get this value-based marketing system, is really be as simple as what's on the right. And the numbers, the, the numbers are just numbers, but we can select a quality grade, pay according to that with you know, some different market access requirements. That sends a clear message back to the producer that you know, what what's creates value for us and what doesn't. And I think the, the future for us is very simple. We want to shift the curve right. Um, we've been issued a challenge, as I said, to improve farm gate returns and improve the returns for the industry. And we think this is the way to do it. Unlock that value that, the, that's, that can we know the consumer will pay for. Translate that back to the industry. Better, more consistently meet the needs of the, of the consumer and it becomes, becomes a very positive cycle. And uh, we really think with uh, getting the industry engaged behind this, we can make some real differences in the next 18 months. And, and finally, it's about you know, this guy putting a smile on the consumer's face. And uh, I was told by MLA to say it is much better than a, a plate of kale, but I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it there. We'll have some time for some questions later, and I think we're right on 15 minutes, Alex.